I'm just trying to find out if you guys, like, are hearing me again. Yay! I'm back. Good. Good, Quindy. Yeah, big internet hiccup there. Like, my OBS went boof. Like, it reset everything. It was like, oh, noes. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, good. Yeah, nobody reset at 25 months. That totally broke it. That totally did. Oh my god. Or or the stream got scared when we mentioned five years. Maybe that was what happened. Yeah, thanks, Quindy, for uh, for telling them to refresh. Yes, yes. So yeah, so the, so the, the funny thing was that we had reservations. Um, we had a reservation at one of our favorite food places, and then we had a reservation at a very highly rated place in Carmel, but we had left our reservation for Monday open, like for dinner, and we really like going to foodie places. So so we're like, oh, we're probably going to, you know, go to, we're, we're, we're probably not going to be able to find great food, you know, down south on the coast, not as good as in Carmel. Who knows what we're going to get for, for uh, Sunday. Well, it turns out we went to like a Peruvian restaurant that was phenomenal. So it's like it all worked out, uh, totally leaving our plans kind of up in the air. Peruvian food, like seriously, I was impressed. I was really impressed. <laughs> I think it was the 20, I think it was the threat of five years that scared it. It just like it, 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 Twitch was not ready to consider that possibility. And so it kicked my OBS offline in retribution and then and then we came back it's trying to send us a message reaper is working on its reward system anyway hey angelo how's it going but yes we're totally the stream is a little erratic today Anne is a little erratic today um oh hey guys so i forgot but i had made a doctor's appointment for tomorrow. So I will not be streaming tomorrow morning. I kind of let Justin know a little bit late. I only remembered it last night when I came back and saw the reminder. Um, that I was like, oh no. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm in, in and out, uh, after being like consistent and constantly on for so long, I'm, I'm like having a, a little bit of a blurble this week. Um, while I just deal with stuff. So nothing to worry about routine health thingy. Um, so just whatever, but I need, I forgot I had made the appointment. So I now need to take the appointment. Otherwise, I'm going to have to wait another three weeks because, you know, doctors. Yeah, so that is the dealio. So what are we doing today? We have a fresh sheet of, of gray paper that I have not yet blurfed all over. That's just doomed. Now I'm going to spill a paint like all over it. So let's work on the butt. Actually, this is looking kind of cool. Like, I'm kind of glad we went with the gray and the blue because look at that. That's like really that really separates her hair from the down below, especially because I went with this really deep blue for the shadows here. So with doctors, it's just hard to get an appointment sometimes. So I think I want to do, let's finish kind of doing our wet blends on the hair and then let's go down and do some, do some stuff on the, the soft stuff down here. This is fun. This is fun. All right. So I think I was playing with, which gray was it? I think I was actually lightening up carbon. Or maybe I was with cloudy. That's really close to cloudy, but something tells me I was working with carbon. Lightning carbon. Howdy, Durham. Oh, did he not? Did he not go through with his promise? Yeah, John, we got to get John on the... He's... Watch, he's like feverishly trying to practice his painting off stream so, to be ready for the next time. Well, now he has to do it. Did you guys have a good ReaperCon Q&A, though? No, we don't even, uh, we didn't, we haven't discussed anything. I don't, I try not to touch on Kickstarter stuff on this stream at all, Shadow Raven, because, uh, I don't know, because I'm not on site anymore. So it's like, wait for other streams to, other Reaper streams to ask that stuff or to talk about it, because it's just not, like, I can't contribute anything. Um, but yeah, so I think I used carbon gray for this. We're just going to get some of this floofy hair. Oh, good. All the questions were answered. Fantastic. Lovely. Yeah, I think I used carbon gray and I was 
playing around with carbon to get a nice shadow that was a little bit different than uh, the the gray we usually get for cloudy because it didn't look great. Like it's weird when you get a sense of like you look at a color and you're like, no, that's not quite cloudy gray. It's a little bit different. It's on the Reaper YouTube channel. What is the Q and A? All right, so eyeballs. I need eyeballs. It's a day. It's going to be a hot day here, I think. It was actually warm in the apartment this morning. Warmer. Like, you know, it wasn't chilly. So I think the weather has finally shifted here. Like, I went out of town, and now finally I'm going to get my nice uh, summer weather. Yes, the Q&A. Okay, so the Q&A is on the YouTube channel. Fantastic. So anybody who has questions about ReaperCon, who's watching this, who missed the Q&A, should go watch that. The only things I can speak to are things like for my own classes. I always recommend you bring your a good brush, a very good brush, the best brush you have, um, especially for, uh, oh boy, I have to go and look at my classes again. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing again? I don't remember. Um, but uh, it's, it's advisable to bring your own brush, a very good brush, if you have one. If you don't have one, I recommend getting one. Um, especially if you're going to take any classes that deal with like layering or fine detail or anything like that, you're going to want the best brush you can get, like seriously. Um, so maybe splurge on a good brush before ReaperCon. And then the other thing I always advise people to bring to my classes, um, not up on YouTube yet. Oh, okay. VOD is available here. Okay. Thanks, Quindy. Thanks for the clarification. Um, the other thing I always recommend you bring, which people don't necessarily think about, is an example of your work, a good example of your work, because, uh, it'll give some instructors like value this. I do because it gives me an idea where you are in your painting journey. So I know how, what kind of at what level to teach for you. So it lets me teach more effectively when I come around and do like, uh, I tend to walk around among the students and help each person individually after I give the general presentation. Like I show everybody individually and then I go back and I troubleshoot individually. Um, so for me, if I'm not sure, I'm, it sometimes helps to kind of have an example of your work. I sometimes will walk around at the beginning of class and ask people, you know, to bring out their minis so I can kind of see. Because that's really, that's going to tell me if somebody's going to need extra help. Or if somebody's kind of there already and maybe only doesn't need me to try, kind of hover over them. That kind of thing. So it's useful information for me as an instructor. It's probably not, it's not every instructor's style. But for me, it's useful. Alrighty. So let's get some little wet blends going on. I got a little bit. There's a little bit of highlighting that we did. I'm going to switch to, I'm a, using a bigger brush, but a good brush. Do, 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 do. I think I did at maybe uh, move a little bit, mix a little bit of my ultramarine into here. There. You know, just plan for next year's ReaperCon. Like, plan as far out as you need to. Like, putting aside five bucks a week or ten bucks a week, never a bad idea to give you kind of the seed money to launch you in that direction. So how I tend to save for vacations is just in little increments. Whatever works for you. Because of course we want all of our awesome fans to come and hang out with us. That's the point of ReaperCon. And of course to turn you guys into fantastic, um, you know, artists because we're all there to help you get as awesome as you wish to be. There we go. All right, so just kind of making nice rounded. I'm leaving, um, I'm gonna go a little bit focused here. So I'm leaving a kind of a dar darker stripe there just cause I, I want to kind of start suggesting um, with the way the hair is moving and I also want to kind of lay the groundwork for like locks of hair even though this is a big smooth surface 
probably especially because it's a big smooth surface, you sometimes want to start breaking it up with brushwork. I did kind of the same thing here, you can see, where I've got a couple of different streaks in it. And then when you go back up to add like extra swirls and stuff, it kind of lays the groundwork for you. So you, it's not just coming out of nowhere. <laughs> ah, Shadow Raven, I see. Yeah, it's a long road trip. It would be, it'd be pretty for parts of it though. Stranger things have happened than, like, finding weird road trip buddies, so. Might want to just, uh, like, put out feelers on the Reaper Discord and say, hey, I'm, I don't know if I can do this yet, but I'm thinking about it, but I'd want a, a road buddy, and, you know, I'm in Western Canada, and I'd want to drive. Is anybody else out there in this situation? Share costs, yada, yada. Let's see who bites. And if you, if you get cold feet about it, you can always say, hey, okay, it's not going to work out for me after all. But there's no, no, uh, certainly no problem in actually just asking. Try to sell for the first time, Durham? Cool. <clears throat> OSL is all about imagining light direction. You gotta think in straight lines. You gotta, you gotta figure out where your light is coming from and then you've gotta, Got to work on that. And OSL, basic OSL is like a good uh, practice for that. And of course, that particular technique also informs uh, non-metallic metal as well. And even shaded metallics, depending on how you're doing it. And even just realistic lighting, like zenith lighting. So usually, you want to start with zenith lighting. And when you feel like you've got a really good grasp, so I'm just adding additional layers of white, blend it in a little bit to make this a little lighter, bringing it up gradually. Yeah, remember that light um, falls off exponentially. And so you really want to kind of, one, you need to figure out how bright your light source is, and that's how much uh, the surface area is going to, you know, how, how light it's going to get. And it's also how fast it's going to drop off. Because as, as light gets, as a surface gets farther away from light, it gets less, it gets pretty dark pretty fast. So I could be doing this with layering, but I haven't thinned my um, my white down that much. So I'm kind of doing I'm doing the quick setup with wet blending, is which you guys see me do quite a bit these days. I especially do it on camera because it's faster. So if I was doing this for say competition, I would likely I might still be setting it up with the wet blend, but I'd be swapping to layering pretty quick. That said, when you're doing like a dark gray to white blend, doing wet blending, if it's in your wheelhouse, is, is a, does, you know, take several, it allows you to accomplish several steps quickly. And it kind of allows you to set up the blends um, a little more easily if you're good at wet blending. And if, uh, if the, if I've got a little bit of a lawnmower in the distance outside of my window, so if it gets too loud, you guys tell me and I'll close the window. I was trying to get the cool air in here before, uh, before it gets too warm. It was, uh, I think it was hit 86 here yesterday when we came back into town. So now I'm accentuating that, uh, that streak that I put in at first. And you see that I also broke up this area a little bit down here. All of this just kind of bringing a little bit of variation into these hair strands, which are otherwise big and floofy and not very featureful. Um, not so much. Uh, fire is bright at the center and, and less bright at the outer parts. So it, this is actually the reverse of fire, Durham. A lot of beginning painters paint fire incorrectly that way. Cause it's a lot of, a lot of time it's how, how it's kind of, um, painted in like children's books and stuff. It's just not painted correctly. It's like kind of how we're taught to do fire is dark to light. But, uh, ah, yeah, I believe it broke 90 in Texas. Yeah, fire should always be light at the heart and, and colored at the edges, like here. You guys, 
guys have seen me paint fire before, you just don't remember it. Snake. Bright at the heart, colored at the edges, and fire just usually does not get to red, is the other thing. It's usually get to a pale orange. Here I kept it yellow because I wanted it to go with Snake's color scheme. But Snake is like, you know, it's it's almost white at the lowest parts, and then as it goes up and away from the heart of the fire, it gets darker. Snack. Follow Snack's lesson. Don't paint fire bad. Oh, yeah. No, Crows and Bones always, always uh, rebuild your emergency fund before you save for vacation is my, my personal truism. Like, for years I lived, like, kind of on the edge because I just didn't understand how important it was to have an emergency fund. But once I understood it, now you cannot part me from my emergency fund. And it's, it's, I don't use it for vacation or anything. Like, and everything else needs to be extra savings. So I totally get it. And don't strain your... Don't put yourself in financial danger for it. ReaperCon is cool, but it's going to be there. We're not going to stop putting it on. Not that I know of. You know, Ed could always overrule me on that one. But uh, don't, uh, don't hurt yourself there. It's important to feel financially secure. To be happy in life, I think. No matter what level you're at. And I am big... I'm a Dave Ramsey fan. Um, though I've departed somewhat from his teachings, but he helped me get out of debt. So like my finances will never be the same. There are some parts of his message that I'm like a little dubious about, but in general, his whole, you know, get an emergency savings fund and make it untouchable and except for an emergency is uh, totally, totally on. Yeah. Oh, you should always watch the stream. The stream is free. All it costs is your time and attention. Yeah, fire is much easier than you think it is, Durham. I mean, honestly, just paint the center close to white, go up to yellow. At the very extreme, if you're looking at realistic fire, the highest I would go would be fire orange. It's named that for a reason. If you're looking at magical fire, you can go, you know, or a big fire. Like, if you're doing a big fire, like, if you look at forest fires, they get very ruddy. Um, like, big, big fires, big house fires, big forest fires can get a definite red hue, at least in photos. You never know, like, if you saw it in person, if you'd see the same thing. But uh, it also depends on what's burning, right? The material that's burning is going to affect the color of the fire. But in general... If it's a natural fire, you're going to see it go up to oranges, not to reds. If it's an unnatural fire, the sky is the limit. It's okay, crows. You'll get back to it. Like, you know. I mean, keep trying. You never know. Because when you're really focused on a goal, sometimes unexpected stuff can happen and make it possible for you. Like, keeping keeping the, the attitude that it is possible that I may be able to go to ReaperCon and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strive for it. At the very worst, what do you do? You miss it by 500 bucks, but you already have, like, the money for next year, most of the money for next year, and that makes it easier, right? So, it's never a waste. I don't think it's ever a waste of effort. You can always repurpose things. Repurpose your effort to a different year. But you've still got a few months, so. Paint some minis for friends for money. Uh-oh. It's, it's the lawnmower. It's attacking. One second. And the lawn doesn't even need to be mowed. They're doing this to grief me, I swear. I knew when lawnmowers attack. News at 10. Right? Should I turn on my fan? I'm going to hold off on the fan for now. I'm at an okay temperature. So you can see how I'm introducing, like, more and more little strands as I get up here. Just to keep that hair, like, moving. And you're just following the natural shape of the hair and putting kind of, like, little waves in, little strikes. See how I did that? Yeah, it's the lawnmower man. No! Please no. <laughs> no. 
It was Stephen King. <laughs> I mean, I love Stephen King. But. Yeah. Right. So it depends on, on how big the fire is and what is burning. But most of us aren't painting forest fires. Most of us are painting fireballs or, you know, like like fire rays or or campfires or, you know, candles or lanterns, you know, so. And again, it's all on what what realism, you know, is, it, I, like if you're not trying, if you're not trying to realist it, be realistic. It's a magical fire. Then, you know, disregard what I say. But I tend to work from real and then just if I'm going to make it more magical, I'll kind of make it obvious. I'll start from a basis of real and then I'll kind of tweak it. Just because I want it to look right. There. So, so there's a few more streaks there. So see how soft. Like kind of keeping these uh, softer, broader streaks is making the hair look really soft. And keeping keeping the motion of the hair, of the, of the sculpt. So I'm like freehanding a lot of this. But when I'm freehanding it, I'm following the shapes that you can already see. to bring the hair around and, and using all these big motions, like big waves instead of little curly cues makes the hair look soft. And that's what I want. I want to see how soft that's coming out. That's just, it's, it's making the sculpt work. And the thing is that all these little streaks and the also introducing some contrast in here, like with the darker gray shadows makes the hair also look more interesting. Right, so you're you're introducing like because otherwise the back of this model could be pretty boring. Like I can see why there used to be a sword on it, um, just because it's a lot of swirls. But when we introduce the colors down here and also that that deep beautiful blue, and you know the difference in the hair color, and we haven't done the leaf on the flowers up here or done any of that. Um, when we do all that, then we make it a little more interesting to look at. And so there's, there's still interesting and, and cool texture and motion to it. What have I got? Oh, shells. I have seashells because seashells, because we went to the seashore. David has deposited my seashells because seashells, especially, I think they're abalone, but they've got cool colors and cool patterns. So I kept, uh, I have to clean them off, but I have some really cool kind of patterns going on. Let's see, where's the cool swirly one? This one's pretty. I like the pale when it gets the pale oranges and blues on it. We went to a place, um, and it was obviously the place where the sea where the uh, seagulls like opened all their shells. This one's cool too, because it has chips and interesting kind of like a blue thing wearing off there. I love shells. This one's another cool one. It's neat. I like seashells for um, ideas for color, for pattern, things like that. Yeah, so you can't go to the ocean and not pick up seashells. Come on. But I apparently left them in David's car and he just went to the store. So <laughs> I got seashells unceremoniously dumped on my desk. Oh, well. I really need like to find a nice... Um, ceramic or glass bowl to put shells and stuff in shells and funky rocks that I find. And I have a propensity. I'm not a huge hoarder of them, but I do have a propensity for sometimes picking them up when I'm visiting interesting places. So now I'm going to bring my white in a little bit stronger and I'm not, uh, really blending it super awesomely. Like I said, I could, I'd have to thin my weight down a lot. And the problem is if I thin it to a layering consistency, it's going to take me longer to build up some of this. So I'm going to kind of do it rougher instead. I'm going to, I'm going to still pop it up to white, but, uh, I'm going to just kind of use the tapering of the width of my brush stroke to imply a smooth blend when reality, in reality, it's not. And that's just a more stylistic way to paint. Like that's, that's how David tends to paint more. Like he's, anybody who's using a wet palette is probably going to get blends by, they're going to thin their paint a little bit more on some strokes, but they're also going to do this sort of thing where to imply a blend, they thin their brush stroke down and that's how it appears to be blended, right? Instead of like trying to make the filter in the perfect smooth blend. Um, it's different styles. It just it gives you a slightly different uh, feel. And here I don't mind it because I'm trying to get keep this motion of the hair. I'm trying to keep some of these strokes. Um, so there I connected that upper mass with this lower mass. We've got this beautiful like kind of S-shaped swirl going on now. 
David was in and out. He actually has a lot of meetings today, but he also, one of us had to go to the store and we were more out, more low on stuff uh, from Trader Joe's than from Sprouts. I, he takes the TJ's run and I take the Sprouts or the Whole Foods, depending. So he was, he was an awesome man and went to the store so that I didn't have to go yet. I'll probably go later this week. I'm in love with our Whole Foods. It's almost, and when everything reopens, I'm going to have to like fight myself because it's called Whole Paycheck for a reason. And I really don't need to shop regularly there, but it's a beautiful Whole Foods. Holy crap. It's one of the fanciest Whole Foods I'd ever, I think maybe the fanciest Whole Foods I've ever encountered. Although I'll tell you, my Sprouts cuts the steak a lot better. That's just the weird thing. Like, our Sprouts is an old Sprouts, so it's tiny, and it's, like, usually would be substandard. But the guy behind the meat counter there came from a real butcher shop, and he cuts steaks like Texas cuts steaks. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I love wandering around, too. It gives me so many ideas, right, Quindy? If, you're, if you like to cook, it can give you so many ideas. And I love fresh produce. And now on my new diet, I can actually have fresh fruit again. So the fresh fruit always looks so good. The produce looks so good. I love cooking with a lot of fruit and vegetables. So maybe I'll make a fish curry this week. Fish curry just sounds like really good for hot weather. So there we go. We've got that. See, I'm I'm not blending. Like you can see the start and, and stop of my brush strokes, but... It's good enough. It's uh, just tapering the stroke is enough because I'm doing... The other thing to remember here is I'm doing texture, right? I'm doing a very smooth swirling texture and I'm trying to keep everything looking soft. But at the same time, I'm still doing texture. And when you're doing texture, you want to suggest brush strokes. So it's kind of like... If you're, if you're getting frustrated with smooth layering, try some texture work because chances are you're, you're right at the paint consistency you need for suggesting good texture. And maybe you could get some wins there and like, you know, boost your confidence and really get a feel for the paint. Any work you do on this kind of thing where you're thinning your paint and you're kind of trying to control it and kind of trying to get a feel for, um, you know, what kind of effects you can get with it. All of that work is valuable. The best I can say is if you're trying to improve, pay attention. Pay attention to what you're trying, how thin your paint is, how much you have on your brush, how much did you unload your brush, which brush are you using, you know? And then switch things up. Have a scientific mind, you know? Kind of employ scientific method. Oh, you know, I, I seem like I've got, like, it's hard to control my paint. Maybe I have too much on my brush. So let's try to unload more than I usually do and see what happens, right? So just a little bit lighter up here because it's going to get more light. Yeah, but that at least, I mean, the thing is, Shadow Raven, there is no too much fat for me. <laughs> and and so, like, the thing is, you can always trim that off, right? If it's, As long as it's not a significant part of the weight. Um, and I guess it depends on the steak, too. But, like, for me, I look for a fatty steak. I want to, well, I... I, I like seeing the, you know, my new New York strips having a decent strip of fat on the side, things like that. But not everybody's the same, obviously. But you can't put the fat back on, but you can cut it off. Now you are getting charged for it. So, you know, there's two ways of thinking there. But, but yeah, I, my, my days on the keto diet, <laughs> I'm afraid, prejudiced me. <laughs> uh, Bug lips lives on a rock of, a rock of cheese or on the edge of the world. See, see, I, I just, I just read that to be that Bug Lips lives on a rock of cheese at the edge of the world. And I think that sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he wishes he lives on, he lived on a rock of cheese. I think that needs to become part of the Bug Lips mythology. Some cultures believe that Bug Lips lives on a rock of made of cheese at the edge of the world. Doesn't that sound like a great legend? I think that sounds like a great legend. It could be a very hard cheese. And so, so the tighter and the and the skinnier you make, notice something here. The tighter and skinnier you make your lines on stuff like this, the the less soft it looks. So as you bring in more striations, unless you blur them. 
it's going to imply like a tighter tensile material and not as soft. <laughs> Mentol. Yeah, it's a good cheese. You could do that. It's orange, right? That's the orange one. I think the Buglip Smithos is a great idea, and we need that. So now, if I want to soften that again, I'm going to glaze with my white up at the highlights to blend them in a little bit more. And that's going to make it... Oh, okay. Swiss type, gotcha. I don't like the flavor of most Swiss. There are a couple of Swisses I like. I'm a hard cheese fan in general. Especially, I love goat's milk and sheep's milk cheeses. So you, we use Pecorino Romano or um, or uh, Manchego in our eggs on the weekend. And I like a good hard cheddar, too. There we go. Sweet. Yeah, I'm with you there, Quindy. It is kind of met otherwise. And I, it has a weird flavor to it that I just never took to, really. That weird kind of mild Swedish flavor that it has. It's never my... Which is weird, because I like sweet things normally. But in cheeses, I like more of a salty, savory take. Let's see. I think that's about right. So I'm just going to do kind of a general fuzzed out um, highlight here. And I'm going to bring that same color up to kind of work into this lower band of white to try to soften everything. So kind of today is about working on textures and softening and hardening. The harder your lines, the harder your texture, the coarser your texture will be. The more you fuzz your lines in with glazes or layering or whatever you're going to do, the softer the texture is going to look. Oh, I like brie. Yeah, I do like brie. I love it with apples or grapes. And actually, I have grapes right now. Why do I not have brie? This is obviously an issue that I need to rectify. Except that cheese adds so many calories. That's my only problem. It's like every time I think about adding cheese into my diet, I'm like, and where will you get that 100 calories from, young lady? Especially since I just ate my head off on this vacation. I probably need to not re-add cheese. Uh, oh, really? You don't like Gouda? Interesting. I like smoked Gouda. Like Applewood smoked Gouda. Yeah, I said I'm going to whole paycheck, yeah. Yeah, that would be tasty, Shadow Raven. That sounds really good. Yeah, you guys are making me want food. But I'm going to make... Um, I'm making a tropical food tonight. I'm doing a... Coconut lime mahi mahi, which is a really quick and easy recipe. So when you get out, you know, when you get home from vacation and you're just tired and you don't want to cook, when you're vaca when you need a vacation after your vacation, um, when you need a staycation after your vacation, that's probably what it ought to be, right? Because it's like you go on vacation and you love it and you have so much fun, but then you get home and you're kind of like feel like you need to recuperate from your vacation. You need a staycation after your vacation. We meant to have more time yesterday. Like, we really thought we were going to get home pretty early, but the traffic uh, was against us. Okay, let's make a nice swirl here. I'm going to introduce kind of a, a fictitious swirl there. Technically, there isn't really a sign that there should be a little fish hook here, but I decided to make one. And this is why this is more freehand. Because you can make it more interesting if you want to. You don't have to stick strictly to what's sculpted as long as you can make it visually work. Let's kind of make this is this sort of thing is fun because it's freehand, but it's freehand without demands. It's like freehand that's just kind of make a bunch of little swirly shapes. Whataburger. I remember Whataburger. I don't miss it so much. I mean, there was a time when I really liked their burgers. But 
now I can make, I don't know, when you, when that moment when like the food you can make at home, like becomes better than the food you can buy. And so in general, then you have this incentive to cook if you have the energy and burgers, it's usually David on the grill, but then I can make my like grilled onions and mushrooms or my sauteed onions and mushrooms to go on top and my fresh homemade guacamole. And that's just pretty much divine burger in my opinion. Oh, and manchego cheese on the top. There we go. So we introduced a little ripple there. Now we don't have a little swirl here, so let's bring that in. And uh, the paint I'm working with with for the gray actually is carbon gray, but it's like a three to one with pure white. So like pure white three, carbon gray one, just because I wanted a slightly different um, gray. And I also wanted the option to take it uh, darker in some of these areas. So I decided to work with a little bit to bring up a really dark gray. It does give you a slightly different color of gray to do that. And actually I'm going to mix up a new mix that's only uh, two to one so that I have a little bit of that darker gray. I want to do some touch-ups. So I'm going to do two drops of carbon gray to four drops of white. Yeah, I guess a, the one, a really good side effect of like, I guess both of my diet and of like the COVID is just that I've gotten in the habit of like cooking. It's pretty much six days a week. Or, or swapping out with David for a couple of those days, but we'll cook six days a week, which I think is a pretty healthy habit. And then if we're going to go out or order out, we just do it one day a week, which which seems is good for our budget for sure. All right, I'm going to put three, three drops of water in that. So it's actually a two to one paint to water. Mix it up and see if it's dark enough for my purposes, my nefarious purposes. Yeah, it is, I think. I'm going to... I'm going to use a little bit of it. I don't want to go too dark. Remember I mentioned that if you want something to look white, you can't go too dark. Yeah, it's coming out not as dark as I as I wanted it. I'm going to put one extra drop of carbon gray in there. Carbon gray is a little bit of a different beast. I do love it. Many of you, many of you seem to like, you know, be like, oh, carbon gray. I thought I'll just mix black with gray, but it is actually a different it's a little bit of a different color. It's always a little bit of a different color. There's always a purpose. Remember also that carbon gray is your go-to for really fast black. So if you're painting up a bunch of wraiths for your D&D game, base coat with this and put a black wash over it. Boom, you're done. That's what that gray is meant to be. It's meant to be that quick black color so that you can base with that and black wash it. And it's just light enough that the upper surfaces will look like you've highlighted them and everything else will look black. That was that was one of our um, one of our evil machinations and reasons for doing carbon gray. All right, and you know what? I do want. I think I do want a little bit of my ultramarine. Where is it? I have my cyan out here, but not my ultramarine. Yeah, it's Ritterlich. We don't want Ritterlich. We love you, Ritterlich, but not today. Uh, Ash and blue. I am not batting a thousand today. Ultramarine Shadow getting closer. Wow. I'm just like, there it is. The last blue I reach for is the blue I need. Okay. Just want a little bit because there are hints of this in her hair. And I don't want to lose all of those. They are mixed with a bit of gray though. So I am going to add a bit of my carbon gray. And a drop of white and see what I get. Yeah, that was, a, it was a trick. Like people were always trying to nail that dark gray when I was like painting GW ages and ages ago. Cause you know, for black Templars and uh, like Legion of the Damned and stuff. But so when I, when we were expanding the line in that Kickstarter, I realized we didn't have this precise charcoal. We didn't really have a charcoal gray. Stormy gray is not dark enough to be a charcoal gray. Um, so carbon, we kind of tweaked it until it got to that level where you could just put it on and put a black wash over it and get good black. I had, um, a couple people test it to make sure that it was good, uh, a good effect. Um, so, all right, I'm going to add more white to that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's just it. You could even use it. It's almost, if there's nothing darker than it on the model, it will, it can read as black. It'll read as a faded black. The better uh, use if you're looking for a, a faded black that actually does read as black, if you don't have anything darker on the model, is... Um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, man, I lost it. Ah, uh, Noir Black. I just did a, did a PDF on that. I should remember it, right? That might not be... I may have, may have grayed that a little bit too much, but that's okay. We can... Uh, we can, we can doctor it. I'm going to end up with a huge puddle of blue that I only need touches of. But that is kind of what happens. That's the downside of the well palette. Although I don't always consider it a downside. Since a lot of this is water. That's a little better. That'll be fine. Yeah, it's a little better. We'll see how we can do that. All right. Yeah, Noir Black is more, well, yeah, if you're, I guess now is a good time to plug the Patreon. Um, I have a Patreon, and it's awesome. You can get PDFs about how to use all these colors. Woo! Um, in fact, I just did one on the first six colors of Forster's Favorites upcoming with the Kickstarter. And uh, other than totally mistaking uh, Kickstarter 5 for Kickstarter 4 because there's been too dang much of them, and you just get them mixed up, um, uh, it uh, has Noir Black in there. So, And the reasons why I like Noir Black. And uh, what I find it useful for. Stuff like that. Stuff like that. And that's patreon.com slash painting big. That's the $5 tier is the one I do uh, PDFs on colors for. We do a lot of color stuff. Though I also snuck in some color theory with uh, my other tiers. One of my other tiers this month. But yeah, go on over. Check it out. I have some free stuff there. Including a handout for my ReaperCon class last year, which is also up for free on Reaper's YouTube. Called Thinning MSP Paints. If you are having trouble with your paint thinning, you should go rewatch it if you've watched it before. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. Thank you for the link, Quindy. And thank you to everybody who is already my patron. You make a huge difference in my life through supporting me. I could not do this. I could not do this every day. I could not stream for Reaper and, you know, I'd have to go out and get a real job or something. I wouldn't be able to produce all this awesome content about the paint line. That was my thing is I never had time to do this before. And now I actually have the time to sit down and write these wonderful PDFs. And things like that. Stuff I always wanted to do, but just never. It takes so It takes a lot of time. The writing of it and the editing of it, the getting the swatches ready and for it and all that. So I'm very happy to be able to do it. All right, so a little swirly, a little swirl within a swirl down there. This is a real job. Yeah, it is. I, I always like, my, my dad does not think it's a real job. He never has. So <laughs> even when I worked for Reaper, when I worked for a real company, I was still working for a real gaming company. And so it was not, uh, it was not a real job in my dad's opinion. So I, I, I sadly picked up his terminology, but you're right. It is a real job. It definitely, it, I'll tell you, you know, what's a real job when you take a vacation and it feels like a vacation, you know, cause then you know that, um, it is actually, you know, pressure on you, right? Like a real job is. And getting away from the pressure feels good. Even though you love what you do. But actually, ooh, guys, guys, that actually lets me, um, that's a great segue. So David and I listened to audiobooks in the car on our road trips. And we started um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who is, uh, uh, I guess you'd call him a behavioral, behavioral psychologist. Um, Nobel Prize winning uh, for his work. And, uh, we started listening to it and in the first chapter, he kind of explains why you need vacations. Like he doesn't explain it like that, but it like hit me right away. Cause when you're thinking slow, which is usually what we're doing at work, right? We're concentrating, we're, we're slowing down our thought process to write a paper or an email or to deal with a problem that is not like just an instantaneous reaction from us. Right. Um, and when we do that, our blood pressure rises. Like, it's just something that happens. Not, like, necessarily substantially, although if you hit a problem, it'll go up quite a bit, I imagine. But but when you think slower, 
your heart rate increases and your blood pressure rises, even if it's just a little bit. And so that explains why vacations are so effective, right? Because then all while you're working, even if you enjoy your job, but if it requires slow analytical thinking, it, it those side effects are real, right? So over months, you probably get tired. You know, that's why, that's probably why we get tired at work and need a break. And he didn't necessarily go into that, go, in, go into that with that in mind yet, although we're only on the first chapter, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if that's kind of why we need vacations, because as we are just in the course of, of the, the typical work of now where you're in an office or you're writing a ton of emails or you're, you know, dealing with issues and, and uh, troubleshooting and all that sort of thing, any of that kind of job, you're going to be spending a lot of time in that intense thinking zone. And that's going to just raise everything, right? It's going to just raise your tension level just that little bit. And over the course of weeks and months, I could see how that would really build up until, ta-da, vacation needed. So it was just really interesting. This is a really interesting book. Yeah. Yeah, right, 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 green users, right? Yeah, it's my dad's attitude. Yeah, is kind of, because he's, he's from, he's from that next generation. He's a baby boomer. But this is definitely not real work in his mind, right? They have, uh, there's just, there's a number of people who wouldn't think that this type of work is real work and that it must not be near as stressful as other work, but it totally is. I have deadlines that I have to hit. I have content I have to produce that requires a lot of thought. Um, all of my coachings and PDFs and all that kind of thing, even the videos, I outline all my videos before I shoot them because I have to, to make sure that I'm being efficient and hitting all my points so that you guys learn effectively. So, or at least that's my hope, right? That's my aim and goal. So it, it takes a lot of concentration, a lot of work and preparation that you don't see, right? You just see the end product. Um, and it definitely stresses me out. Like if something like last month when I had technical difficulties and I kept shooting, trying to shoot videos and they kept, I kept having mic issues or OBS issues, like, oh my God, that was so stressful. I so needed this vacation. So yeah, no matter what you do. Yeah. Dealing with people too, because often that's the same kind of thing, right? You have to slow down. And you can't just say whatever comes to your mind, right? That's fast thinking. Fast thinking is the stuff that we do automatically. Weirdly, and David and I were talking about this, but miniature painting can be either. They can be either thinking fast or thinking slow. So either A type thinking or B type thinking. Because if you're learning that you're going slow and you're analyzing it, that can be like, that can be tougher, right? But if you've already internalized how to do something, then you're just doing it and you're enjoying it and you're kind of in the moment and you're not analyzing it. So then you're just in the stream, you're thinking fast, you're just doing it, um, which is uh, doesn't have that effect of raising your heart rate and uh, blood pressure. So painting can be totally zen or, or it can be more of, you know, more of a challenge depending on how you choose to do it. So based then on what I learned, I would kind of recommend you do a little bit of analytical painting followed by quite a lot of relaxed painting. So like every once in a while, if, if you're in an evening or a day where you have a lot of energy, maybe try doing some, you know, some really analytical painting where you try to improve on a technique, even if it's just on a test model. And then after that, just paint for enjoyment. But just every once in a while, do some improvement painting so that, you know, you, you reap the benefits of both, right? But you're not stressing yourself out with your hobby. Because we totally want this to be, you know, our Zen place, our happy, happy place. So now I'm built, I'm setting up again for a big, a big mass here. Fast thinking is more relaxed thinking, but it can also get you in trouble if you, uh, if you don't question it and you need, you, if you, if you run into a problem then and you need to slow down suddenly, it can be, uh, it can be difficult, right? Where you're like, oh, wait. <laughs> Maybe this isn't appropriate for this uh, for this uh, situation. It's interesting. I, we're only in the first chapter, so I really can't wait. Like, I'm kind of sad our road trip is over because I really want to listen to more of this book. But we also listen to audiobooks while we paint in the evening sometimes, so I'm sure we'll we'll be listening to more of it. I'm totally happy I bought it. It seems like it could be a good insight book to how brains work. It's also about critical thinking a little bit, and I need to be better at critical thinking, so... Critical thinking is definitely thinking slow. 
So we're more swirls. Look at it. It's all like coming up. Look at that. Isn't it neat? I think it looks like a maze. It's like a maze in her hair. This is how I originally envisioned this, guys, with all these little swirls and stuff. Kind of making a, a, a lot of motion up here. Yeah. Yeah, I get in, I used to get in my zone just and just do music, unless I was looking for like, like when I first listened to Dave Ramsey's uh, Total Money Makeover, it was a great book to listen to while painting, because it was really inspirational, and it, it helped kind of hype me up and make me uh, feel like I could do it while I was relaxed and painting. Like, it was just, he's, he reads his own books, and he's really inspirational, so... I still listen to that book every once in a while, even though I'm in, I'm in much better financial uh, situation now than I was. Just because it's a, it's a really inspirational one. I'm trying to save money for something. It makes me think I can do this. I'm going to kind of mess up what I did down here a little bit. I want to make it a little softer, go for a bigger wave, and then I'm going to put in a little bit more detail. I think I want it a little lighter. It was a little too dark at its heart, that swirl down there. Yeah, kind of, right? But yeah, music is where I used to get in. That's where, if I really want to just get in my zone and go, Durham, I'm totally with you. Because And that's, uh, but but now that I paint with David, it's different because he doesn't like music as much. Like, it's not his happy zone. So we've kind of compromised and gone to the audiobook. The otherwise, if I really, really want music, then I'll just put on my, my noise blocking headphones and he'll put on a TV show on his computer and we'll kind of do separate things. But we like to paint together. So that's not ideal. That's just when we're both, if I feel like I need to like really focus down and get something done, I'll be like, I need to get in my Zen zone. So I'm going to music. But the audiobooks are nice when we're painting together. But yeah, when I, before I moved in with him, when I was in Texas, that would be, it was all music in the evening. I would just sit and put on my, one of my playlists and go. He's, he's, David has a really math brain, um, which can be a musical brain too, but in his case, it's not. His, his mom actually was the daughter of a music instructor at a university. And so he grew up with music. And he likes musicals, which is awesome because I also like musicals. Um, but he's not someone, he likes to be taking in information. Like just listening to music is not his thing. Whereas I like, I am a very musical person. I did swing choir, sing, swing choir, madrigal choir, regular choir. You named the choir I was in it um, since I was pretty young. And I always loved to sing. I, when, I was a when I was a really little kid, I wanted to be Julie Andrews. In the sound of music. She had the most amazing voice. I would sing along to the sound of music all the time. The soundtrack. My parents got me the record. Record. Yes, folks. Yes, that's how old we are here. Um, but, but yeah, David's not like that, though. He's wired different. So we come, uh, we, we get a compromise going on, as with all the best relationships. There we go. Getting a little bit of swirl going on down there. We got our little S swirl. We're really making a lot of progress today, guys. Oh, hey, we got a stretch. You want to be a dragon? I wanted to I wanted to ride a dragon because Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern was the best thing ever. So I actually built myself a snow dragon outside one winter because we had enough snow and it was the right packing thing. So I actually did the whole body and then I made the neck like it actually stood up, I think, for a whole day with the little head on top. All right, I'm going to do a stretchies. Stretchies, it's stretchy time. I See that? I totally get that, Shadow Raven, because that's the way... Um, I can't listen to fiction when I'm driving. Like, it was the weirdest thing. There was one road trip. I tried to listen to um, uh, the first... Uh, oh, boy. <sighs> Urban Fantasy Mage. You know who I mean, the guy. Really popular. That thing. Dresden Files. I tried to listen to that first book on the road, and I learned that fiction is just, for some reason, maybe because I have to imagine so much, and I have to be, um, you know, like, 
listening to the characters and the story and all of that. I can't do it. It makes my brain really tired. All right, stretch, please. Everybody stretch. Get up and do just a stretch. You just have to stand up and put your arms over your head. Just for a few seconds. It feels so good. Come on, you know you want to try it. First, it's free. Ah, oh, there we go. But yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I can't listen to fiction while I drive. But I can listen to nonfiction. Maybe it's because I don't have to construct the world and the people and the story in my head. I can Instead, I can absorb facts. Although I do find that I absorb more if I also read the book. But that's just, I have a lot of read, uh, good reading comprehension, I think. I only made a snow dragon one year. That's... <laughs> That's probably because they needed to Shadow Raven. <laughs> Sometimes it can feel wonky when you crack something that hasn't moved for a while. I do, I feel it. Oh, stretching hurts. Too much gardening. There's not too much gardening. I bet your garden looks fantastic, Kernico. Hey, you know, actually I saw foxgloves this weekend. Like I took a picture for my mom. I hadn't seen foxgloves in person before. Really cool looking flowers. <laughs> sand dragon. Sand dragon would be harder than snow dragon. More difficult. I'm going to do my floor stretches. Sweet. We are back. I can see that. Snow animals for sure, green users. <laughs> Could totally do a Venus de Milo out of snow. So you probably want your snow woman with arms. All right, let's power through the rest of this hair. Then next time we'll have like, you know, rainbow smoke uh, will be our subject. That'll be good. Actually, while I'm here, I'm going to I see I missed a spot down here. I'm going to totally paint it with my blue. Though my blue is a little bit muted. That will be ready for next time. Every once in a while you do miss a spot. I missed a spot right there. There, now that's all fixed. Now we are ready, ready to do our blue next time. So let's finish up this white. Yeah, I can see that bees would love, love fox gloves. Boop, boop. Here, where's my fox glove picture? Yeah. Fox gloves are so cool. They're so cool. Oh, here you go, guys. Those who aren't on my Patreon. That's where I was this weekend. Hiking. We hiked around in Big Sur. I got 14,000 steps in one day. And 57 flights of stairs. Oh, nice. Butterfly bush. Yeah, it was really beautiful. It was, there were people around, but it wasn't like super, super crowded. We definitely decided we wanted to go back though. Like, um, going south, more south, like of Monterey, um, past Big Sur. Actually, there's a bunch of really cool little towns down there. that we were not previously aware of, like the place where we found our Peruvian restaurant and we decided we had to come back 
So we will plan another one, another trip down the coast, probably, because there was stuff that was still closed that we couldn't um, go to. Like Hearst Castle, which was the inspiration for Citizen Kane. The movie. Um... So yeah, we uh, we definitely decided we were going back down there. But then I didn't feel like I saw enough art galleries in Carmel. We ended up with uh, we we did a lot of hiking, and since we did, we we didn't do as much of the other stuff that we wanted to do, which was cool. But it felt like we tried to squeeze a week's worth of vacation into four days. If you guys ever had that that a thing where you've like got all these great plans, but then it just figures it just feels, and you think you've got enough time for everything, but then it just feels like you didn't quite hit as much as you wanted to hit just because of the way things worked out that's that's kind of where i was like walt disney world yeah lucadio thank you 13 month prime yeah i know everybody's waiting for kickstarter i'll have um then i'll have a terrain piece that i can do for you guys because I ordered Mandapar Pass. So maybe we'll paint terrain. Like, and it's a big terrain piece, too. I'm going to have to figure out how I have to raise my camera up. And there'll be snow leopards and yetis. So we can paint a snow leopard. And a yeti. Uh, Two-week vacation only did half of what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, you should you should uh, plant some wildflowers. You have a brief growing season in Canada, but it's I know a friend who lives up in Crow's Nest Pass in Alberta, and she manages to have some lovely flowers for a few months in the year. Even if they often get startled by like snows in like May and uh, September, not so startled since you live up there. You know, you kind of expect it, but still. There's early and then there's early. Hmm, I think I wiped out too much of a shadow here. Just want to kind of figure out what I'm doing in this little area. I have a dark shadow. I feel like I want some shadow there. But maybe not. Maybe I don't need it to be quite that dark. We'll do some tuning at the end here too, just to make sure I've got enough white. Because right now our hair looks more light gray. But I think I can get it up to white. It's just the amount of white you have, white or near white, you have in the piece at that point. So you some, sometimes have to do some tuning. Like you set it up and then it's just that like uh, the reason that it looks like gray is that most of my hair I'm not taking up to pure white yet. But I could totally take it up higher. And I don't so much mind if her hair looks silver either. So I'll, I'll adjust my... Um, my expectations or my, uh, you know, what, it, according to what I like, if I like what I see. Yeah, I want it. Well, the border's closed now, so I meant to come up for, uh, my friend up there is a dog breeder, of course, because dog people, like, I know, I know so many people all over, all over the world through miniature painting and through dogs. Um, but yeah, so since the borders have been closed, but I have wanted to go up and visit and uh, see one of their puppy evaluations. So maybe it'll open up and I'll be able to go up. That would be cool. Plus, you know, eventually we'll be in the market for a new puppy, so. You can only typo today, not type? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I did not order a pirate ship, so you guys are going to have to look to another painter to paint one of those. I'm sure somebody's going to paint it on stream. So I'm glazing with a bit of white here to soften this out, make it look softer.
Mix sand into soil. Oh, interesting, Kroniko. I didn't know that. Thanks. I don't have a yard yet, but if we, uh, if when we get a yard, I will totally want to plant some flowers. So I will totally hit you up for tips, Kroniko, when that happens. There we are. Yeah, somebody will do it with a triple, triple zero brush. You're right. Yeah, they're just big. They're just big, big stuff. Really cool, like, um, you know, thing to put up on top of a couple of bookshelves in your uh, gaming room, you know, to use in a special scenario. Be tempted if you got that to like run a pirate game, like a sh maybe a short campaign so that you can like really have an incentive to use the boat a lot. There we go. Let's block out some of that dark there. Yeah, I managed to resist the Scale 75 Kickstarter, even though I like those a couple of those Zodiac models, but I just have too many pretty things to paint, so I'm going to concentrate on what I've got. Once I've painted a couple things, once I've finished a couple more things, then I can look at Kickstarters again. But I've got all these beautiful Limbo models, like Wolf Rider. I'm making good progress on uh, the Templar bust, thanks to uh, streaming it on Thursdays. on my own channel, which is twitch.tv slash painting big. For those of you who are interested and uh, who have time before Reaper Live that you're just kicking around, might want to tune in. That is when I do my own stuff. And uh, she's a competition level piece. So you guys don't usually get to see me paint at that level on here. There. That looks nice and soft. I like that. Oh, look, it was. He he said, yeah, He I think he saw mine at one point. He's like, oh, yeah, I love that piece. And he's like, I like where you're going with it. Yeah, this one, guys, for those of you waiting. You can see how everything is starting to come together on her. Uh, a lot of the NMM is, uh, is good now. And, and we started on the chain mail. We're making that work. So about half of the chain mail is done. So we're almost to the point where we need to work more on, uh, on the arm here and the sword. So all the NMM is like getting there. Like it's, it's moving. Oh, uh, Mika, it's, uh, it's not like I'm doing the front, but the back is like totally plain. So it's got a lot of cloth on it. And for a long time, I wasn't sure what uh, pattern I wanted to do, but yeah, we've got to do all this metal still. So I'm going to duplicate this on the other side and I also need to finish the front side here but now that I have the front side mostly figured out the back side isn't going to take that long it's moving right along though moving right along the back side is going to have a lot of the red cloth is going to have a lot of freehand like I'm I'm looking at this will probably be the best thing I've ever painted when it's done just to give you guys an idea if you want to watch me paint it while I'm painting it Tune in on Thursdays at around uh, 4 p.m. Central USA time. But I have no doubt that when I when Templar is finished, she will be the best thing I've ever done. Hands down. I, I already compare her to my previous best, and she already is better. So, yeah, thanks, Mika. It's a lot of work. A lot of time. 
the NMM, especially figuring out the Sky Earth NMM, which I was not an expert in when I started it, I decided to, the best models are always the ones you kind of push yourself on. And there are still plenty of things that I can get better at as a painter. So I decided to really push my NMM on that one, my Namatalk metal, and see what I could do because I just love that lion shoulder pad so much. I actually held off. The, there's a reason I held off painting the back side of it, Mika, and that's because I'm, I'm doing all the more boring parts of NMM now <laughs> because the lion was so much fun that I knew if I just did the lion, I'd run out of oomph on the rest of it. So in order to paint the back of the lion, which is a treat, I have to finish all the other NMM. Then I can paint the back of the lion. I do that to myself a lot because I know how prone I am to like, you know, just exhaustion on any particular part of a model. So I try to do the parts that I'm not as excited about earlier on and then uh, save the best for last so that when I'm really tired of the mini, I still have things that I really am interested in to work on. That's, that's why the cloth is going to be last because I love freehand on the cloth. And so... I'm excited for the pattern that I want to do. So if I save it, I know I'm going to be, I know I'm going to feel like doing that at the end, no matter how tired I am. Whereas things like finishing out the hair or the sword are not, uh, not necessarily as exciting. I really should do the leather gauntlet because it's like, that's kind of a, although I do like leather. Muppet sing along. Yeah, you can. I mean, Kirill does that. It's a cheat. It's it's a valid cheat, though, Valandar. Kirill does. Um, he'll like put the the model into. You know, he'll get the three D render of the model if it's a bust that he's uh, painting for the box art, and he'll light it. He'll like do like, and he knows enough on the 3D modeling to, to do the lighting and everything so he can get his NMM perfect. So he, then he paints what he sees. So it's a way for him to kind of keep an eye on his NMM and double check himself, not having to like just constantly be reevaluating re it in his head like I'm doing. I don't know enough um, 3D software to uh, do that sort of thing. So I'm doing it the hard way. But I don't mind that. I mean, I'm kind of a fan of the hard way. Because if I use the hard way, I know why I'm doing it. And sometimes if you just kind of paint what you see, you get it, but you don't get it. You have to think about it. So I do like, there is merit in both styles. It's definitely not a bad thing to like use the 3D mapping, the rendering thing to uh, give yourself a map. Especially not if it keeps you painting because you're happy with the results. I can't have dessert until I finish the rest of the dinner. Exactly. It works for me, though. It does work for me more. It's, it's less, uh, saving like the absolute favorite thing for last sometimes and more just getting the boring thing that I know I don't like out of the way. Cause if I, if I get the crap I don't like out of the way, then it's otherwise, if I, if I walk into the room and all I've got is stuff that I don't want to paint left on the model, it's never going to get done. I'm just going to put it away. I made that mistake on a model last year and now she's sitting in the closet and she'll sit in the closet forever. Probably. Until I prime her over and restart her the right way. I, I globbed this up, so I'm trying to fix it. I don't know either. Pink Floyd. I went to see the wall many times because I had a friend who was really into it when I was in college. I'm just doing a little bit more wet blending down on this little area. 
it's hard because it's I'm trying to get it darker. So it can be a little harder to nail the blend from the light to the dark. I'm going to lighten up that area. So that looks better. Well, technically, I wonder what I wonder how you classify the wall. I wonder if it's the same kind of movie. I've been reading my script writing books again lately, so I'm like, because Muppet Movie is definitely a road trip movie. It's obviously a road trip movie. And the Wall might also be a road trip movie, only a psychological one. I don't know. Getting there, getting there. Oh, I'm talking more, um, there's a, there's a type of genre and that isn't a general genre. There's a, that movie, um, writers and producers use, there's a genre classification system and it has, it's, it's definitely not like standard, like a musical or a rock opera or whatever. It's more, um, about the story deconstruction. So like road trip is actually a genre in that that particular classification system and it can be a an actual physical road trip like the muppet movie or it can be a mental road trip like a character like you know descending into crazy in their own head like in the wall so as uh i study script writing a lot because i know plotting is my weak point sometimes and uh it seems to help me make better stories make better plot because pacing is hard when you're writing So like the the genres in the in the movie, uh, the script writing system that I use are things like Dude with a Problem or um, Buddy Love, which is pretty much any love story ever written. But it can also be like siblings or parents or whatever. You know things things that actually um, uh, talk less about like the like that it's like not a science fiction genre, but like the actual core of the story. It's a really interesting stuff. But I don't recommend reading screenwriting books unless you want to be thinking about this crap every time you watch a movie. <laughs> like David's like, don't tell me anymore. It's going to ruin movies for me. I'm like, you're right. It probably is. <laughs> so I don't. But like another genre would be like um, Monster in the House, which I think is what Jaws is classified as. So it's like there must be a house, which can be a boat on the ocean, and there must be a monster that you cannot escape but must deal with. Uh, Poltergeist also is a traditional uh, monster in the house movie. But yeah, the genres are cool. And it's, uh, there are perks and uh, weird stuff around. Like there's, there's uh, things in each where you, where there are kind of like um, tropes that uh, a lot of movies will, that follow a particular genre will use. It's a, it's interesting study, but if you love movies and you love to just enjoy them and not think about them, don't, don't get into reading about screenwriting. Do not read these books. Yeah. Alien is monster in the house. Perfect. Mech styles. Yep. Ah, but that, um, but not so much because they're trapped on the boat with the shark, right? The shark is like attacking the boat. Like that's the kind of the core of the movie. Like you can't leave the town. Like, okay, everybody could have just packed up and left the town and wouldn't have had a movie. <laughs> but you know, they're, they all live there. They're trapped there and the shark is hunting them on the beach. So yeah, it's, it, I think, and, and these, these, like I said, this is a particular system that talks about, like, I think there's 13 genres, um, and each one has a specific name. 
Big Game Hunter might still be a monster in the house if the Big Game Hunter was stuck in Africa and there was a monster hunting him. Um, like Jurassic Park, I think. I don't know what Jurassic Park is. I should look that up. So yeah, you could have like um, a Big Game Hunter movie that turned into a, that was built around a monster in the house premise. Like the Big Game Hunter goes out in the wilderness and then terrible things happen to him and he's stranded out there alone and the tiger, the mad tiger is hunting him or something. That would be a monster in the house. Because he can't, the key is that to have a monster in the house movie, you can't just leave. Like there's something that keeps you from leaving. You have to deal with the monster. You can't just leave. Big Game Hunter isn't a genre. Um, I think I'd have to remember what Crocodile was doing. Like, I think he's a, I think that counts as, it's either superhero or the opposite. There are two genres that are flipped on their heads. One is a superhero and the superhero movie, well, obviously, but it isn't always a superhero movie like you think, like an X-Men movie. It can also, it's usually just somebody with really unusual, like, somebody with exceptional abilities thrown into a normal world who has to learn to cope. And so Crocodile Dundee definitely has some, like he's, he definitely has some exceptional things, but mostly they work against him. So he could be the opposite. I forget what the opposite one is. There's a superhero and then there's a, maybe it's just, I don't think it's dude with a problem. I think it's uh but there's a one genre that flips that on its head, which is a normal person in an extraordinary world. who has to learn to cope despite not having any powers. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. Dude with a problem is like a, is almost one of the most generic of the, of the genres. So like, um, uh, let me see, like Bruce Almighty might be a good example of, uh, like a superhero movie. Or the mask where, you know, he gets extraordinary powers, but then he has to like, like there's a downside to them, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not sure. There's a, I don't remember all the genres off the top of my head, but it's an, it's an interesting way that this particular system tries to classify movies. And it's, it's essentially just trying to break down the core of what makes the story work. So the window dressing of the story, like the particular setting, doesn't really matter. It's more the core of what the story is trying to accomplish. It's interesting stuff anyway. But yeah, if you don't like to like microanalyze your movies and kind of figure out why they work, then you do not want to read screenwriting books. You want to just enjoy your movies. That's why I'm not going into too much detail. <laughs> I don't want to ruin movies for you guys. But knowing the genres is kind of fun. Like trying to figure out what genre it is. That doesn't ruin the movie. It's when you get into this fine structure of it that you can be like, oh, that's that and that's this. Oh, yeah, yeah. TVTropes.org. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because tropes are definitely a thing, and even tropes centered around particular genres. I mean, obviously, like, there are fantasy tropes and science fiction tropes and all that, but even even more so, like, when you're looking into the movie movie system, like, I'm talking about even those genres uh, have tropes. Probably the closest um, genre, like in my in the system I'm reading about, the closest genre that it, that mirrors like a standard genre people like think about is called the Why Done It, which is almost always the the genre of any mystery movie. But it doesn't have to be a detective movie. But it, it's f focused around, you know, more, not just the what has happened, but the why. Not just the who, but the why. So obviously, it's like, movies like Silence of the Lambs are, is like a why done it. Because the key to figuring out, to finding the killer in that movie is, is understanding why he does what he does. So it's interesting. It's interesting stuff. Let 
Alrighty. Getting this last little swirl bit done. It's fighting me because there's this big broad area. And I've got, I think my paint's gotten a little bit too thick. And I've got a free hand here. I need to be a little more delicate with my free hand. It's getting toward the end of the stream, so I'm getting a little tired. And I think that's when I start uh, trying to rush things. And that's, uh, that's when you just take a step back. Like if you're painting and you are like, dude, like I'm just like not getting it. I was perfect up to now. And now for some reason I'm blorfing all over the place. Um, you're probably just tired. You probably just need a bit of a break, especially if you're trying to do things like, or in, in this case, you know, when I'm doing these streams, yeah, I'm kind of like just painting, but I'm also in, in like talking to you guys. So it definitely does, uh, does tire you out when you're, when you're concentrating on things for a while. For me, the hour and a half is really a good, uh, kind of benchmark to work in. Can sometimes do two hours depending so I'm going to just set up that kind of like a little radiating thing there. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Determinator. Yep. Everybody's got different ways. Like when you, when you read like books from different authors on this sort of thing, or you look at particular websites that are curated by a particular philosophy, you, everybody's going to have a different way to talk about like, um, like, you know, the, the heroes and the, and the particular tropes and the particular like styles of movie. And I find it so interesting because, yeah, I forget there's a, the Determinator thing that you're talking about is like, is um like they say when you have a character, like you have to give her uh, grit, like it's, it's, it's uh, smarts or grit or like, you know, like there are certain categories of positive attributes and grit grit or perseverance is one of them. If you have a character who's not exceptionally powerful or exceptionally strong or even exceptionally smart, um, if you make them stubborn and determined, that's that's enough. Like that's a key personality trait in heroes. And actually that it's funny that you bring that one up because that's the key character trait in my main character in my book. Like my main character, I've got three mains, but my main main isn't particularly smart. Or strong, and she doesn't really have, uh, you know, like any special abilities, but she's determined. And the fun thing about that kind of character is really that they will accumulate so many bad decisions and so many, so many things will happen to them, right? Because they're not exceptionally smart and they don't have superpowers to get themselves out of stuff, right? Hey, Deborah Walk. Yeah, we're talking about movies and uh, tropes and uh, like plot systems and fun stuff while I sit here and try to get myself like I definitely got tired down here. So these aren't as good as my swirlies up top. I'm not as happy with them. I may have to come back at it when I'm fresh. And sometimes that happens, guys. Like I'll just set it up now and I'll be like, OK, I have to probably come back and hit these again when I'm uh, when I'm fresher. That's totally workable. Hey, I'm doing, um, I'm submitting Grey Wolf. So, although I also stopped because I, uh, the thing is I've been getting good feedback from agents and every time I get, like, there's been just one where I got a, a really, like, just a really short piece of feedback, but it was key, like key to really seeing a weakness in some of my scenes. So I'm just finishing up fixing that now and then we'll go on. So I don't know. A lot of people... There are a lot of people who will give you advice when you're a writer, just like when you're a painter, and that advice will not work for you. So, like, one piece of advice that I was given was that, you know, I should just not stop and revise in between submissions. I should just go. I don't believe in that, actually. I think that, especially seeing now the positive changes I've made after getting that piece of feedback, I think if you get good professional feedback and it opens your eyes to a flaw in your work, you should absolutely stop and fix that flaw. Like, there's no downside. What, why are you in a hurry? <laughs> like, okay, maybe if I had six months to live, knock on wood, hopefully that won't happen anytime soon. But, you know, uh, so yeah, so just like that, with painting, every piece of advice you get, you should kind of take and see if it's true for you. Even if you get it from me, especially if you get it from me, I am going to be the first one in the world to say, if crap that I'm telling you does not work for you, disregard. So essentially, I saw a weakness in my work. I've been able to fix it. I'm almost done fixing it. And then I'll start another five agents. will get my, uh, get my submissions. 
Yeah, Durham for sure. Oh, neat. Short film. Super Jabberwock. That's exciting. Yeah, MacGuffin. That's, I mean, that's the key, right? Like the Maltese Falcon. That's the classic. The Maltese Falcon is the, is the, the movie that people like, this is the MacGuffin movie. This is, but yeah. And they, there's a genre for that in the system. Um, it's called the Golden Fleece is the genre in the system that I study. Where again, it's a quest for a thing that, you know, may not be the whole point of the story, but it, the quest of the, but having the thing powers the story forward, having the thing to chase. And Golden Fleece and Road Trip are very similar. They may actually be the same genre. I may have mixed them up, but there we go. Yeah. All right. So that's not too bad now. I still feel like I need to fade it in a little bit more, but that's not too bad. Oh, do do do. Oh no, Valandar. Yeah, put it, put a, um, uh, put a off topic link. Tell people you're working on a short film and this is my link. If you're interested, check it out. I'm cool with that. Put it on the off topic. Yeah, off topic is where to go, where to put it. Yeah, I mean, the question to ask yourself is, is this true for me? Like as the painter, uh, does this advice resonate with me? Can I see it, right? Does it, does it seem like true to me? And you might need to put that aside, Max, put it aside for a little while and just kind of write down the feedbacks and then come back to it after a bit and kind of really look at it. Sometimes you need a fresh eyes, uh, like a fresh eyes after a couple of weeks or easier. Cool. Hey, they're cool. We are, we've been talking a lot about like movies and things and stuff. We've talked a lot, a lot on this stream today. But I think we're about done with the back of the hair. There's some, I've got some side hair, side hair I need to do. Um, but yeah, and side hair over here I need to do. I could probably do this one real quick. But yeah, because I'm tired, I'm not, uh, my paintwork is not quite so crisp and clean as it usually is. I have a bunch of video editing to do later today for the Patreon. That'll be sinking all my energy into that. That takes a while. There we go. There, now I've got that one and I can actually take this strand and kind of use the side of my brush and link it up down here. So we can keep that little bit of white kind of coming down and I can make some strands going off of that. So essentially the more I take white strands and uh, interrupt like areas of darker gray, the closer to white my hair will look. And the more gray I keep showing, the further from white my hair will look. Although it's getting light. It's definitely silver hair at this point. I kind of like the silver. I might keep the silver. I do need to like fix up this part down here. Now that I've got my the gist of what I'm doing on the back. Now I can extend that all the way around. I still might, one way to bring all this up would be also to glaze the entire thing with white. Um, Gaston has an on topic question. Hold on, hold on, I missed it. Can you repeat, did I miss it? Oh, dark metal? Okay, yeah, I missed it. Uh, okay, so is it dark metallics, Gaston, or is it dark, um, NMM? I need, uh, I need to know. Yeah, we're kind of at the end of the stream right now, so, but if you tell me what it is and what in particular you're having, was trying NMM, um, if you wanna, you have to take it up to pure white, even if it's dark steel. It's, the, the pure white highlight is gonna be what makes it look like metal. Um, hold on. We have a real quick reference. I have a real world, oh no, did I put it away? <gasps> I put Fire Giant away. Do I have another one? Huh. Yeah, I do. One second. 
Let's bring out Aegon. So this is not a Reaper Mini. Sorry, I put away Fire Giant. When you want to play Dark Steel or Dark Metal, you still have to take your highlights up to white. You just leave a lot of the body of the metal dark. Um, so the, essentially it's the, again, just like with the hair here, it's the amount of area that you leave dark. Like here I wanted, I wanted it to look quite dark blue, black. And so I did bring up my highlights where the light would fall because that would happen even on a dark metal. If you go out and look at a, a, uh, a wrought iron lamppost, you're going to see that the side of the lamppost in the light is notably lighter, but then it goes very dark, um, in, when it turns away. So this is a piece I did for Dark Sword miniatures, but uh, the Targaryens are supposed to have black or near black metal. Um, let's see if I've got another one. Visenya. This is Visenya doing roughly the same sort of thing. The metal looks darker because I'm leaving more dark. I'm putting in very dark shadows. Um, you can see like the really it's where the highlights are falling are where you've got the light on her. So does that make sense, Gaston? You've got to just keep a lot of dark in here. If you want pictures of these, um, I think Jim has pictures up on Dark Sword Miniatures Facebook. And probably also you can find the pictures up on, uh, up on his website. So you could actually look at these for longer than I'm showing you here. But the key is to keep a lot of dark. Yes. No. I mean, I, I'm using a lot of dark here. Look at it. Like, there's a lot of dark. And what you can't have, then, is as much detail in your midsection. But, like, if I was doing NMM, normal... Do I have a normal steel NMM? I do not have one right now. But if I was doing... Uh, it's the same thing with... Xandros's hammer. So Xandros's hammer is bronze. So I've kept the majority of it dark but I'm still bringing it up to white on some of the polished areas and I'm just leaving more of it dark. If you use pure white highlights, that's what keeps it from looking dull because the pure white is like, that tells you what, that it's shiny. That's the indicator that it's shiny. You need both dark and pure white in order for NMM to look shiny. You have to have it. Usually with dark metals, I don't actually blend it up very much unless I've got like kind of a rounded surface like this. But even here, I jump from a dark to a, to a white very, very fast. So, and I'm just pinpointing some white over here. And I haven't put all the white on, little touches of white on the hammer here yet. Um, but that's how you do dark metal. It's like you keep the majority... You keep the majority of uh, the metal dark, but you have to take it up to white. There's no other way to suggest shininess than to have that white highlight. You've got to have it. You don't have to have it big. You just have to have it there. So yeah, you want more of your... You want instead of a kind of a mid-tone color, you want it a little darker probably. Yep, hope that, hope that helps. Like I said, you can go over to Dark Sword and go and look at that. It would be in their George R. R. Martin Masterworks line because those are the Targaryens, I think. Um, but yeah, so you can find those models and see, see them in person and kind of study it. Yeah. Well, I was, I was working on her hair. That's why, that's why she's here, here, there. Now she's saying, eh, 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 don't make judgments. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think we're good. Thank you all for coming out again. I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow, so I will be out again. And then after that, I promise I will be consistent for a while. Um, in, in two weeks, David's parents are coming, so I may need to take a day off in there. But, uh, but other than that, I'll be a consistently here. Anne, um, after my doctor appointment tomorrow, that's my goal anyway. Um, but yeah, I will be here Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. So yes, thank you all so much for showing up. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow is, we're working more on gold NMM and probably some steel NMM on Monique. She's almost done. Monique, the uh, uh, vampire chibi. Yes. Oh yeah, Crow's Nest. Oh, it's Jean. Yay. Yeah, my, good. definitely tune in for Crow's Nest, guys. Tomorrow's Wednesday, sorry. I keep thinking it's Monday. 
because Memorial Day doesn't count. <laughs> I, I have my idiosyncrasies. Just like I thought it was Bones 4 and not Bones 5. Like, come on, I have no brain cells left. I, I give it all to you guys. Anyway, tomorrow, Wednesday, we will work, or sorry, tomorrow, or tomorrow, Thursday. <laughs> tomorrow I'm out and Thursday we will work on Monique. There we go. We got it right. Finally. Oh, does it? Am I confused for a reason? <laughs> That's a rarity. <laughs> Usually I'm just confused for no reason. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great day and definitely tune into Crow's Nest and we'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Or sorry, not tomorrow morning on uh, Thursday morning. Thank you. Bye-bye.